in glasses and disorder solids, which we had started about 48, 49 years back, and which has now grown into a very big conceptually important thing in the area of qubit in particular. And uh, Tony calls it the Cinderella problem of condensed matter physics. And why he calls it, I'll come back to a presentation by Tony himself. Okay, and <clears throat> this is given why he calls a Cinderella problem. You can see it in YouTube. I've given the link. You can directly see it. If you have earplug, listen to it. Don't have to listen to me. He has really very nicely described the problem. And uh, those who uh, care to teach it sometime in any of the classes, this is a very nice YouTube video that he listened to. And it's a characteristic Tony style. <coughs> and an apology that I'm not exactly working on the type of problems now, but I do make occasional excursion to this particular problem. And I'll tell you one problem that I'll finish up with, just flash one data, where I think many of the concepts which Tony has talked about have directly come in. The problems where I have now worked on and where Tony's contributions become very important is in the area of two-level system and one by EF noise. I will touch on that also. But I did directly work on the problem of quantum tunneling in my early years, in my PhD days, in my postdoc days. And this is the, what I plan to do. The quantum, you know, just the three things I like to talk on, the genesis of the problem, some of the developments and very recent issues, again, not in detail, but just flash it into some of the important idea, the ideas, and particularly embed in that the contributions of Tony. Now, as Krishnamurti pointed out, that we met Tony first when he gave a theory seminar in Cornell in one of the Thursdays. And that was in 76, if I'm not uh, mistaken. And at the time, he was working on uh, uh, Helium 3. And if I go to the Clark Hall during this period, there are a lot of hot problems. There are two other hot problems I didn't note. One was the condo problem, which Krishnamurti, Wilkins, and Wilkins, and uh, uh, Ken Wilson worked on. There was another hot problem, and that was the problem of essentially, you know, size quantization, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, these are the three problems in which uh, we had a lot of exciting times, and all these three uh, had uh, connection with Tony. And uh, the story goes. As far as the Bell theorems goes, uh, uh, Andy Marmino was teaching a course in quantum mechanics, and Onupam was present in the course. He was not a student. He was a student, but he was not a student in that course. And many students had an argument over, you know, someone got this uh, Bell's theorem thing, and there's a lot of argument, and that is the whole thing started. And you can see how exciting things can be when you have things around that. I'm personally also grateful to this gentleman who got me into this particular thing of quantum mechanical tunneling, and they're really the guys who made this field experimentally extremely, uh, you know, rich. Okay, now this is the paper which started this particular field of quantum mechanical uh, uh, tunneling. This is the thermal conductive and specific of non-crystalline solid published in 1971. And then these expansions were given by Andy Phillips as well as by Anderson, Halperin, and Varma that there are quantum mechanical tunneling states that gives rise to this universal problem. So let us see what they have observed. Chirar and Paul, they have observed that, like if you measure the heat capacity of even an insulating disorder solid, you get a linear term. And uh, that is, uh, at this excitation are sitting and you have a crystalline solid, it gives you a two-cube contribution. And then it's kind of a density, if you get it from this line, is our so many per energy per meter cube density of state. And uh, essentially, these excitations have an energy less than one Kelvin. And what is also important is that this vitreous silica, if you take essentially it's a glass, vitreous silica, that its thermal conductivity goes at low temperature as T square, and but in the crystalline solid, it should go as T cube. Afterwards, uh, you know, a lot of, you know, after this discovery by Zeller and Pohl, and particularly the theoretical prediction of uh, Anderson and Phillips, they found out that particularly from dielectric as well as from elastic experiments, there, there is a two-level structure, and these two-level structures uh, uh, are localized structures. They don't themselves carry heat, but they do scatter phonons. And of course, since they have their own thermodynamic, they give a linear uh, heat capacity. And these things have been worked out in the first few years of the discovery of the, uh, the, you know, the, our, you know, the universal property. Now, if you look into the argument at the time, that is, uh, why there should be 
such low energy excitation and why tunneling is needed. If you look at it, the characteristic energy scale of below 1 Kelvin is actually quite low for a solid. Only magnetic excitation generally we know that are uh, that low. And they're much less than the thermal energy as well as the electronic energy scale. So this, this said that, listen, it comes from uh, some kind of a, uh, the, you know, at, uh, groups of atom tunneling. And the whole idea came from, again, from uh, Paul's earlier work on doped alkali halide, that you can have atoms, till now unknown entity, and that is where a big objection came from Tony, that how can you have things which are so unknown yet universally occurring on all these other solids, and that give rise to you know, equivalent potential barrier, and they give rise to tunneling. And if you look into it, these are the two states, and there is asymmetry delta, and the tunneling splitting you can uh, write in this fashion, where uh, the, this is the, what you call the tunnel parameter. Now, if you translate it, you can take the tunneling state into a two-level system where the energy is given by combination, the asymmetry and the tunnel energy. And the important thing is that there's a wide distribution of the density of state, which is needed for both the dynamics as well as the thermodynamics that one sees in glasses. So now everything is boiled down to a very simple Hamiltonian that you have the tunneling states. These are the tunneling terms, the, the asymmetry term, and they uh, couple to a strain field through this coupling parameter gamma, this is the strain coming over here. And then if the strain field is provided by something dynamic like phonons, then obviously you are going to get transition and you are going to the phonon assisted tunneling. And that is going to go give it to a relaxation time of this particular form. You know, this is algebra is uh, so uh, simple that it, uh, even we can understand. Like you don't have to be very uh, engrossed into, this is the beauty of the whole thing that is uh, algebra is extremely simple and extremely simple to understand. And the important thing is that you, this kind of behavior that you see if you make an approximation and they are linear in T and uh, this is what you observe experimentally. So if you look into the dynamics of this system, there is something very simple in them. And the simple is that if you look into the internal friction, which is like the acoustic attenuation, and for simple uh, thing about internal friction is that if you go to buy a, a porcelain or a glass in a shop, the shop pickup will do something like this. What it measures is essentially the internal friction. If the glass is good, the sound will last longer. And if there's a crack inside, you know, the sound will not last. So it is exactly that that you know what the Q factor of that oscillation and that goes to some kind of a constant number. And this is what you see in a number of solids that uh, this is again vitria silica measured at different frequencies from 484 hertz to 43 megahertz. You see there's a constancy over a temperature range. This kind of uh, constancy comes from what people call the relaxation of the two level system in a full on bath. Now let us go into the uh, thing that what is important in this context of the two-level system, that there is something called a standard tunneling model. And the standard tunneling model looks like this, that you have an asymmetry and you have a tunneling term. And what is important is that if you look into the density of state, you can quickly write down that the density of state should look like this. And if you convert it into a plot, you can see that it's a very funny looking function. What it shows is that if you get the uh, relaxation time, that even the density of state has a dependence of the relaxation time. And uh, you can write down very quickly that if the states are very symmetric, that there is no asymmetry, they quickly relax. If they're asymmetric and the tunneling term is very small, they take a long time to relax. Now, if you look into this particular diagram, what it means is that there are a lot of fast relaxing states and there are a lot of slow relaxing states. And the important point is that if the number of one is fixed, tunneling model fixes the number of the other. But both of them exist. Now experiments are becoming very clear, and particularly when you look into spectral wandering, that I'll be just flashing some data, that there are both fast relaxing tunneling states, slow relaxing states, but whether the number densities are completely connected, that is if you determine one, the other is automatically determined, that yet has not yet been decided. And you know, these are some of the very important predictions that came up that the internal friction should look like this, temperature dependent, there's a plateau. The sound velocity or the you know, elastic constant should look like this. And one of my, when I started my postdoc work, that was a pretty hot problem. And I did this ex uh, mechanical experiment until about 10 milli degrees. And essentially, uh, within the error bars, 
could fix up most of these approximate uh, of the observations that could occur in the standard tunneling model. But of course, then we found out that I did the experiment an extremely small uh, strain power, and in that limit, the standard tunneling model completely works. Well, then came a paper by uh, Claire Yu and Leggett. Uh, I, I understand Claire was a postdoc of Tony, and this is a very interesting paper, and it was a short paper. And, uh, and there actually it, uh, Tony raised the issue that is it rather accidental that this property is so universal and uh, he raised there the first thing that among the TLS can interact among themselves and which is turning out to an extremely important thing and they can actually give you a collective mode which can lead to dissipation and they give an alternate view. Now <coughs> afterwards it has been developed the interacting TLS idea and there are experiments that proved it and let me tell you what is that experiment. The experiment is a you know you take uh, vitreous silica make a paddle oscillator. The experiment I did it was a vibra you know it's like a vibrating reed that is clamped and the clamp loss is quite high. What they did is that uh, this actually comes from John Rippey's experiment. You know, you, Chandana was showing the John Rippey's oscillator, it's a torsional oscillator. So then, uh, that uh, torsional oscillator is such that you have the one mode vibrating this, one mode vibrating this way that actually takes care of the uh, coupling loss at the end. And so they could go to a very low uh, loss factor and you can see these experiments have been down to 8 or 9 milli degrees and you can find that there is a complete background of the standard tunneling model for Q inverse doesn't it have a single alpha but it depends on the frequency that you measure and there are a lot of developments after this particularly from uh, 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 Christian Enns who was in Heidelberg who took up Hunglinger's chair and uh, the, this is a very lively area. So now, is it two-level system or is it only in two-level system? Again, there's a big bombshell came in 19, in, in 2013 from Tony, very recent bombshell. And Tony in his characteristic style discussed a number of problems that has occurred. And he said that, listen, you guys have checked all this model to very low frequency. Test the model at a high frequency. The highest frequency till date, we will test it is only 1.3 of the thermal energy. He said, if you go to higher energy, you may see the deviation and you get an alternate expression that was should be tested. But this experiment is actually difficult until date. It has not been tested, but hope one of these days it will be tested. And I'm pretty sure then, uh, I, I like the time, it's a smoking gun. So, you know, like whether this model is correct or not, that can really be tested. Let me now come to the universal as aspect and uh, finish up some of the old genesis problem. This is a review by Bobby Paul before he uh, took his retirement in 2002. And you can see the how universal. There are a lot of uh, unofferous solids over here. So within one order, they have the same behavior. Same in the internal friction or the loss. Number of solids have the same uh, behavior and that is what you know, uh, people thought is the universality. Now, this problem really whether it's universal or there are glasses where this thing doesn't exist has not been sorted out. Look at the year, this is 16, this is 17. And one group, and this is now becoming very hot in the case of uh, organic solids. But people are making very high quality single crystals and in some of these crystals, people find that there are very little, it depends on the stability of the glass. And if the glass is made more stable, let me just quickly say what we mean by stability of a glass. Glass is a quench system. So it has a lot of entropy into it. So the built up entropy, that is related to some of these TLS. So if you by annealing reduce this entropy, then you expect at some limit then you should not be seeing the state. So people are doing that kind of experiments and that is what uh, these uh, particular things have come up. Let me now come to one very important topic which is extremely important particularly in the context of qubit where this coupling, uh, this 2LS system is actually coupling to the electrons. So this is the experiment that I did on a metallic glass which is a disordered solid and you can see that it has this flat nature. It shows that the metallic glasses where there are electrons that they can actually couple to the two level system. This is actually a work done in 1999 at Cornell. They made again the parallel oscillator from very high quality silicon, deposited a lot of metal film and you found out that you don't have to be uh, a glass, you just have a disordered film, you see more or less the same behavior what you should be seeing in a metallic glass. This essentially takes us to a very important thing that 
if you use a metal film, this, you are essentially living with the two level systems. Interesting physics came from Dan Ralph in his PhD thesis with Bob Barman in 92 at Cornell and where they showed that you can actually have a condo physics from the two level system. And what they did is that they did an experiment on a microconstriction made in a silicon membrane and then filled it with copper and other materials and they showed that if you measure the dynamic conductance of this constraint at a low temperature then essentially down to you know, 0.1k then this temperature and the voltage behavior essentially makes it look like a condo system. And there is a very interesting classes of things developed at that time. In fact, actually Dan Ralph, most of the work that he did afterwards was dependent on this particular idea that you can have condo physics from the coupling of the two level system with electrons. Well, I now stop here talking about the classical two level system and bring in some of the Tony's observation. So I can live with glasses, I can live with disorder solid and TLS system, but then I'll be living in a cocoon. What Tony did, basically, he said that, listen, there are glasses, universal behavior, but if you, main takeaway is that you have a two-level system which is interacting with thermal bath. Take the physics from it and see whether one can apply it in other system and or other types of physics. And the important ideas that came out of it is spectral diffusion, decoherence, and dissipation. And the three areas where it has started having direct impact is two level system and one by F noise. This I will not talk about. This is an idea on its own thing. This is essentially bringing quantum mechanics into a nanomechanical system and TLS and qubit. I will just touch on these three things before progress shoots me down. Okay. Now this is a fantastic paper. It takes a long time to read. At least it took me three or four readings even when my was, brain was slightly active in 87. And uh, you can see there it has all fantastic and famous names in it. Very rigorous paper. Tony, how many pages? Maybe 40 pages, old paper, no? Uh, it, it, no, it, you know, it is a very detailed paper. But let me give the takeaway from the paper. The takeaway from the paper is that he showed that you can have a spin boson model. And uh, that is giving rise to a, a large variety of quantum phenomena. And that is extremely interesting, very motivating to learn about that. And if I look into a number of experiments that are getting done today, not only just in solid state physics, in biological application, relaxation in molecules, uh, liquids and all that, this concept is coming in a big way. I just recently reading a book by on, on the quantum dissipation by Weiss and I'm just taking uh, four, three lines from that book. It says the dissipative effects of SBM have represented a central topic of investigation for decades, especially its referential for the whole quantum information processing, TLS as a source of decoherence in qubit. And that is what I'll be touching today at the end and see where we are going to. And the whole topic is just sizzling now. So the question is that, can you have a spectral decoherence? Can it bring decoherence, spectral? So let me see what it is. So you have a bunch of two level system and suppose they have a resonance with each other. But remind me that the energy consists two parts. I can be a slowly relaxing state. I can be a fast relaxing state and that matters. And the moment it happens, what happens is that the energy level starts fluctuating. And that is a very important concept that has come in. It was formed by uh, Jim Black and Bill Halperin when Black was a graduate student of Bill Halperin. And, but, huh? Oh, but I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Chandan. Okay. So, uh, uh, so in 1977, and they, they actually formed this concept to explain the, the heat diffusion in glasses and time dependent heat capacity. But afterwards, it found out that the concept is rather general and it spends a central thing when it, people are talking of decoherence. So, dephasing of electronic phase by two level system really happens in a mesoscopic system. And the first experiment is very clear. Question came from experiment by Mohanty Jariolan and Wave in 1997. 
What they did is that they measured the magnetic resistance below 0.3 K in a number of metallic glasses. Now, magnetic resistance is very interesting. In metallic glasses or disordered metal, uh, you have the, uh, the, you know, the weak localization, and that weak localization you can suppress by magnetic field. Now, weak localization is an interference phenomena. So, when you apply a magnetic field, you are breaking the uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, the time invariance and uh, immediately you see the resistance uh, uh, going down and that uh, gives rise to a magnetic resistance. The important point is that that gives you a measure of the dephasing rate of the electronic phase. What they found is that Okay, as I go to lower temperature the electron phase should be long lived but they find that after certain temperature it is becoming a constant value. So then the question came, if I have a cartoon over here, that have a continuous spectra with which the TLS are you know, uh, interrogating, then this thing should be going like this, this rate, this is just the inverse of that. But if I have a gap in the spectrum, then it should go to a constant value. So that is the takeaway from this particular experiment. So then I started looking into it, that is around this time, that if that is the thing, see what happens is that then can noise and TLS be coupled that I have this particular idea coming in. So at that time we found out that you can have uh, the doped uh, silicon uh, the behaving with two level system and it also behaves like a disordered solid when you go to a high level of doping and it gives rise to the universal conductance fluctuation and that was the central theme of the thesis of Arindam Ghosh. So what we did is that at that time we worked out that if a, val uh, if a volume in which the uh, which is of the size of the over which the electron maintains uh, 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 the phases, and then if we have fluctuators within that volume, and they will contribute to the, uh, the you know the so conduction noise, and then one can find out that the deviation from the one by f behavior one couple it to the actual volume of the phase coherent region. So we then worked it out and we found out that this ratio can become a constant and it becomes independent of T for both of them have the same dependence. See this is have coming from noise, this is coming from magnetic resistance measurement. Now this is the sample that you have used and you can see the magnetic resistance from which you can find the decoherence length and you can find out that it is going as T to the power minus half etc etc. So we took that. Then from the noise data, we measure the value of beta. So these are two very different experiments. One is magnetic resistance, other is noise experiment. And then we found out that actually this ratio remains constant within the experimental uh, you know, uncertainty over a uh, the good temperature range. So this is this experiment along of course with others brought the TLS and the 1 by F noise into kind of a very similar platform. So now I then quickly jump to the decoherence and noise in qubits, one of the most important topic. And uh, see what has happened is that you take the qubits, whether it is a charge qubit or a phase qubit, what is happening is that there, are, there is an extrinsic factor that you are coupling to the external electromagnetic field and that is uh, giving you decoherence. You can take care of that. There are a lot of clever engineering that has done. But then the system, it has an intrinsic source, what you call the enemy within that because of the materials that you are using there, the film, the L203 uh, tunnel barrier, there are two defects sitting within that and they have two level nature and uh, the fluctuation of the various physical quantities actually has a 1 by F nature and they are all coming from their coupling to the uh, uh, two level system and you know like smoking 1 by F noise is also injurious to health but it's health of the quantum coherent dynamics and that is the present problem in the qubit that how you tackle it. There are two very excellent review essentially by Altshuler and co-worker where this problem has been very nicely addressed to particularly the last one where they talk of the various types of qubits, how this problem comes in, how the TLS concept comes in over there. If you go back in time translation and look into one problem which has been again worked by Chris Rallis. Uh, he was also a student of Barman, this was his PhD thesis, where he again looked into the what you call the noise coming out. How much? Almost done? Two minutes? Okay, fine. So and what they found is that as you go to high temperature, this beautiful uh, two-level structure that comes in the noise goes away. So their main conclusion there was the system of interacting defects 
actually creates large number of metastable state and the system is actually wandering around in all these metastable states and that is where a large number of the problems that you are looking into started. And the noise and decoherence, there are you know, two main decoherence mechanisms that is coming in. One is the TLS decay, are the fluctuation of the TLS that produces one by F noise. I will skip all that and just come to one very recent experiment where the concept is not only a TLS, but even if you have dilute number of TLS, you can create a bath of TLS. This is pairs bath, but what happens is that there are now experiments using squid, essentially the qubits, where you can see the thermodynamics of this bath and you can me measure decoherence from this bath. And this is the most modern types of experiment that getting done looking into the rabbi oscillation for, you know, you can tune into one of the TLS by their energy by a high frequency microwave and then essentially look into the rabbi oscillation that gives you the, you know, filling and uh, the population uh, variation and see how it is relaxing with time. Well, now what Tony's work has done, I feel it has taken, you know, uh, two important issues into one platform. There's tunneling in glasses, these are a solid and one by F noise. Let me just finish now with the last slide. What is I am into, which is I'm thinking about currently, the glassy physics of electron glass. If you look into it, there's an aspect of kind of freezing, there's an aspect of one by noise. Importantly, this is one by one system where the fluctuation is not Gaussian. And let me touch on that and finish. See, the idea I'm taking from uh, this particular paper that you have random sites when the electron is freezing. But the sites where it is filling can have a two-level structure. And if that happens, I'll tell you an experiment. This we did it to one material which has a freezing at low temperature. And uh, this is the noise part. And you can see the noise also goes down or freezes out as uh, the charge is freezing. Fine. But if you look into the probability distribution of the fluctuation coming, you see as you go to lower temperature, you have a complete breakdown of the uh, Gaussian fluctuation. So this is a class of problem that we find out, which is now coming, which is, I say, the new version where the TLS is coming in, particularly in the electron glasses, that when the charge is freezing, is giving rise to large noise, but that noise is no longer a simple Gaussian noise but a lot of non gaussianity and other issues are coming. I'll just stop here and just say the quantum two-level system, essentially it is present everywhere in crystalline solid and disorder. It started its journey four decades back, remains a puzzle, but it has grown in perspective and has encompassed an enormous amount of active research area. And of course, is an area of physics where Tommy made very seminal contributions. Thank you. This uh, qubit decoherence that you talked about, has anybody done a serious assessment of uh, its impact for scalability of quantum computing? Oh, yes, yes, yes. In fact, it is, I must say, you know, like uh, maybe one of the most active areas now. There are quite a few groups which are looking into the size, scalability. And you know, there are a lot of solutions so that is verdict? coming out. The verdict is that it's a difficult area, but it will be done. That is the feeling that I get, you know. Of course, uh, it depends on which side of the uh, thing you are sitting. But I personally believe that it's a doable problem. It will be sorted out.